Hi, good morning, and welcome to today's presentation, Improving Your Security Posture in 2021. I'm Joe Paquette, Director of Business Development Northeast, and soon you'll meet our featured presenters, Matt and Dave. If this is your first time joining us, welcome. And if you are a regular attendee of our seminars, I truly appreciate you spending this time with us. Uh, housekeeping, if you have any questions during the presentation, send them to us via the chat field. If we are unable to answer those during the presentation, they will be logged and we'll be sure to reach out to you after the event. So with that, Dave, we'll get started if you don't mind advancing. So today we'll have introductions here shortly. We'll talk about things we are seeing, always important to me, you know, what are Matt and Dave seeing in the field, what's happening with our customers. We'll talk about resources available. We're gonna have a couple demos. We'll show you some tools and talk about services that, that we can provide. And as I mentioned, Q&A, whenever it makes sense for you. Today's goals, um, number one, always want to provide you with information and insight. We want to make sure this information is relevant to your current state. So what are you guys facing? And hopefully we're providing some content that can help you. And, you know, really importantly, hopefully can demonstrate how New Era can help you address current threats or challenges you have. We'll talk about this at length. We're all trying to, you know, address our security postures. And if we can help with those current threats, that's our goal. So what are we talking about here truly? You know, what if we could reduce the complexity of securing your digital estate? What if we could leverage data points in your network to continuously monitor and validate that users and devices have proper credentials? And importantly, what if we could do all this while reducing the support and maintenance responsibilities of your staff? That's really what we're gonna to try to talk about today. So as I mentioned before, what are some of the things that we are seeing in the field? A lot of the common barriers to helping achieve our security posture are lack of time, resources, and expertise. We're gonna show that data in a moment. Also, it's difficult to stay current with the ever-changing landscape of security. And I find this a lot. A lot of security initiatives seem to start and stop along the way. We can't sort of get to the completion. Sometimes it's difficult to get funding. Um, you know, stakeholders feel like they haven't been attacked or haven't been compromised to a, to a large degree, so funding can be difficult. Here's a big one, we see this a lot. Uh, I'll ask Dave and Matt, I'm sure they're gonna elaborate at some point, but having multiple point products in the portfolio can make it difficult. We're ingesting data from a whole bunch of different points and doing that can make visibility difficult and that data isn't correlated very well. And lastly, you know, things are coming back to normal, it's, it's great but we're still feeling the impact of this massive shift in our workforce. A lot of us entered remote users. We, we, we got them out in the home. We supplied laptops. We started using Teams and, and Zoom and others in full force. And we didn't really have the time that we typically would have to do the due diligence. And here we are today, you know, we're still doing perhaps that same thing. So feeling that impact, and wondering what it'll look like when we start to re-enter the office. So I mentioned um, the information we gathered. I always like showing these because it's relevant to, to you guys. So of those that answered the questions, have you faced a security event or compromise within the last year? 30% said, yeah, they have. Luckily, the same 30%, felt as though they addressed the root cause of the incident. This one on the right is really interesting to me, and I, I think it probably has more to do with semantics or possibly understanding what the zero trust model is. I feel like a lot of you probably have adopted some things we've already talked, that we're gonna talk about, 
and maybe just have it put it in context to this zero trust model that Matt and Dave will talk about. Also, one of the uh, major questions here was, what are the challenges when trying to meet your organizational goals and requirements? Lack of budget, we talked about that a while ago, so almost 40%. Staying current as well, a little over 40%. And lastly, not surprising, right? It's lack of time, resources, and expertise. Uh, I know for sure, both for us internally and for you folks, if you're trying to hire security professionals, it's challenging. There's a long wait. It's difficult to find those folks. Put that into your organization. We're responsible for you know almost everything. It can be a challenge. So not surprising that three quarters of you are saying, yeah, I don't have the time or, or expertise to do this. So we had that graph a second ago about zero trust. Um, you know, here, here's my very quick summary of this, and I'll ask Matt and Dave to truly correct me and add to when it makes sense. But, you know, what is zero trust? Paraphrasing, we're going to continuously look to challenge the identity of someone who's trying to access the network and applications and data. So, the days are gone where we're trying to do the perimeter trusting and verifying and all that sort of stuff. We are gonna challenge someone's authentication rights based on where they are, what device they're using, what applications they're trying to, to get to. And I would say the third paragraph down really is important when I talked about those point products. Zero Trust is going to look to aggregate these different technologies, so MFA, SSO, endpoint. We're gonna to try to take all that data and correlate it so we can give you guys a full picture of what that security landscape looks like. So you can then make decisions, you can act if there's an incident. It allows us to be much more proactive in managing our environments. So quickly before we get started for those that are new, a little bit about New Era. You can see globally here, 40 offices worldwide, about 1,600 employees. And just know in the landscape of your organization that we have the services and resources to assist you from everything from uh, today, we're talking about security, Microsoft. You can see collaboration in UC, physical security services, managed, Cloud Blue is our hosted services. Uh, division. So just know if if you're saying, hey, how can I how can I leverage New Era? I, I think we could probably help you in in a bunch of ways. I mentioned before some of the um, the pillars of our organization, the services we can provide. And Dave, if you just scoot to the next slide, um, Matt can talk about this in detail, I'm sure later on. But just know from a Microsoft perspective. The end goal that, that we always come to, I know that I've preached before for those that I've worked with here, let's leverage Microsoft to the highest degree possible. If we are consuming it today, if we are consuming 365 in Azure and other services, what's available to us that allows us to effectively manage our environment in a way that can reduce operational cost and can reduce risk in our environment? A lot of those services are there. A lot of folks aren't leveraging them. And again, our goal is to say, okay, how, how can we do this? And as you can see here on the left, in the two left boxes there, uh, everything from a census migrations, licensing, um, and you can see the different platform services that we can support. So Matt, I'll ask you at some point to, to certainly elaborate if it makes sense. And I think Dave, um, yeah, that'll be it. I'll, I'll see you guys at the end of the presentation, but at this point, I'm going to turn over to to Dave and to Matt. So thanks, everyone, again. All right, thanks. So yeah, I'm Dave Branscombe. I'm the guy there on the right-hand side. I'm a cloud security architect with Microsoft. And uh, Matt, I'll let you go ahead and introduce yourself real quick. Thanks, Dave. So we have Matt Gergenti, the Vice President of Professional Services. Uh, I'm actually out of our Houston office, so we're uh, come from an area where we're heavily focused on 
business continuity, disaster recovery, and all of those now play in with the security side of the house as well. A lot of oil and gas, healthcare, uh, without going into all the detail, prior to being in IT, I was a paramedic and that went from paramedic into IT, which turned into Office of Emergency Management, actually managed uh, some hospital districts and 911 services. So obviously security, HIPAA, personal privacy information, as a large part of what I've been doing for the last 25 years. Nice, yeah, so um, I'm probably gonna be picking your brain on a couple of these slides, if that's all right, Matt. Absolutely. Things. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit here about uh, the, the model of today's network. So in, in years past, we used to really only be concerned with securing the data, the devices, the identities, um, that existed inside of the corporate boundaries, and, and Joe alluded to that a little bit earlier. But as we've seen over the, the last 16 to 18 months, um, those events have really forced nearly every organization in the world to rethink how we're doing things. And we had kind of been on that uh, trajectory already, um, but uh, the, uh, uh, the, the pandemic really accelerated that process. So at this point, you might be managing identities for a user population that includes your employees, but it may also include partners or contractors. Um, sometimes even bots have identities that, uh, that you have to, to manage, and they may be using their own phones, their own devices. Um, we store sensitive data in multiple cloud services. We've got devices that are deployed in supply chains, fields, factories, buildings, and we might even be sharing users, devices, apps, and data with partners and vendors. So the corporate footprint that most organizations have right now and how we protect it looks a lot different than it did uh, just even five or 10 years ago where uh, dual perimeters protecting our assets uh, was kind of the norm. So, uh, Matt, if I, if I could pick your brain on, on this first slide, actually, thinking about the customers that you've worked with over the last year or 18 months, do you see this model um, as being the way that businesses plan to operate for the foreseeable future, or do you think that what we're seeing is, is more of a temporary change? Yeah, I think it's pretty clear the, the remote workforce or the mobile workforce is not going away uh, for a lot of different reasons. Uh, partly is obviously companies trying to be competitive with employees are needing to allow that remote work or work from home model um, where historically large organizations wanted everyone in the office around the water cooler walking up to the copier. Uh, that's just not a thing anymore. Uh, we're actually seeing in the enterprise space, which historically has been the slowest to adopt the remote work model. But obviously in the last 18 months, even in the enterprise space, we're seeing the shedding of real estate or turning offices into uh, hoteling solutions. Uh, Microsoft went to this model years ago. As a matter of fact, I was there when we launched the uh, MTC office in Houston, which was the first cloud-based, hoteling-based Microsoft office uh, and a couple of years back. And it was really cool to see what was really neat is looking back over the last, you know, since it's launched, how effective it was. So obviously with the pandemic, this model has accelerated. And, you know, what Satya said, something along the line of 36 or, you know, three years worth of technology and development and road mapping was deployed in three months, right? Because of the pandemic, where this plays into us and where we're seeing with a lot of our customers is, they were simply in a panic uh, adding VPN licenses or turning on remote services or uh, adding additional feature of uh, people into Citrix farms and things like that, not necessarily understanding the impact to the bandwidth, the impact to the data. What are they connecting from? Corporate, typical enterprise, right? VPN. You would deploy your VPN client uh, and people would hop into the environment that way. Well, now they're doing it from home. Some people are doing it from the same PC that their, their kids use in the evening to, you know, hit the different social medias and, and uh, play games. And I'll date myself and say Police Quest from way, way, way back. But uh, so we're seeing a lot of this model. Not only is it deployed, it is staying. We're seeing 
organizations of all size adapt to this model. So they're not they're not looking on how do we shut this model down and go back to the way it was. It's definitely steady state moving forward. Uh, but now the big focus is how do we secure it? Right. Yeah. And, and, and I think that's, that's kind of been the, uh, the mantra uh, from maybe three months into the pandemic was, okay, we've got all these services deployed. Now let's figure out how we can kind of rein things in and, and start securing it. I think that's uh, kind of a longer tail to, to accomplish. Um, so how does this translate into the changes in, in, in the way that we work? So um, as the slide here points out, 94% of organizations are using cloud services. If you think about uh, comparing this to what was going on five or 10 years ago, um, I personally can clearly recall so many customers that I talked to saying that they would never ever move to the cloud because they could secure their data better than Microsoft or Amazon or Google ever could accomplish. Um, in the last two years, I haven't spoken to anybody that made that claim anymore. Uh, I think the, the, the default now for many organizations is I'm putting it into the cloud unless you can prove to me why I shouldn't. Um, we also see uh, a number of mobile business apps being accessed daily by employees. So that means that uh, you have to be able to secure the apps, but also contain the, uh, or, or, or secure the data that the apps contain as well. 60% um, of organizations currently have a formal bring your own device program in place. This number may actually um, be much higher now that uh, uh, the, the work from home model has become uh, a little bit more prevalent. Uh, the, 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 these numbers came out uh, probably in 2018, 2019. Uh, this is a number that I did pick up this morning though. There are 10.07 billion internet connected devices in use worldwide. And this is expected to triple over the next uh, nine years. So we have to secure these devices as well. You can't just ignore the fact that your refrigerator is connected to the internet or uh, your toaster is connected to the internet. That does make them uh, vulnerable and they can be used by people uh, to accomplish uh, bad things. And so for better or worse, uh, we are living in a new reality. Uh, the old assumptions are not gonna keep us secure in uh, what we might consider to be this new world. Uh, we can no longer make the assumption that everything behind a corporate firewall is safe. Um, and then that leads us to the point that we need new principles of security. And that's where, um, as Joe alluded to, the, the, the concept of zero trust comes into play. And these are the three uh, pillars that underpin the concept of zero trust. Explicit verification of users, the concept of least privilege access being applied to users, and this assume breach mindset. Now, what I have heard from different vendors is that Microsoft effectively has thrown in the towel on breaches by, by making this, uh, this assume breach um, statement. That is not the case at all. What we're saying with assume breach is that um, what can you do inside your network to minimize the impact that an attacker can have if they do get inside your network? So, so we call this your blast radius. So if you think about when a bomb explodes, um, there, there, there's a, a certain distance um, outside of the initial impact area, the initial crater of that, uh, that bomb, where a person is in danger, right? So what is the blast radius for an adversary's attack inside your network? If they compromise one identity, how many other identities can they compromise? If they compromise one device, one application, one server, what else can they get to from there? And so you need to implement a security strategy that prevents them from making those lateral moves to other identities, other devices, other services. That's what assume breach means. It isn't a surrender um, and, and an assumption that uh, there's nothing you can do. Um, it's exactly the opposite. It's what can we do to contain an attacker if they're able to uh, breach your network? 
And so when we get into this, uh, uh, this zero trust in a little bit more detail, uh, the concept is that every access request is strongly authenticated, it's authorized within policy constraints, and continuously inspected for any anomalies uh, before granting access. So the essence of zero trust is very simple. Security models that assume safety based on an authentication coming from a certain network location are inadequate. In other words, we can no longer trust that simply because an authentication is coming from inside the corporate network, that it must be trustworthy. That's no longer the case. So how does zero trust work from an architectural standpoint? The zero trust model takes identities and devices and analyzes the state of those two components. It's going to look at things like, has this user performed multi-factor authentication? Is this user logging in from a location that they typically log in from, or is it an unusual location? What is the status of this device? Is this device a bring your own device, or is it within the uh, confi uh, confines of Azure Active Directory or my on-premise Active Directory where I'm managing and policizing and, and have some control over the device? What is the risk state? Um, am I able to analyze the patch status, the antivirus status? Um, you know, are, is the data encrypted and so on? We're looking at these things and we're also looking at what is it that you're trying to get to? Are you trying to get to um, Exchange Online? Are you trying to get to Teams? Are you trying to get to SharePoint? Are you trying to get to a set of virtual machines? What network are you trying to get through? So there's this policy engine that exists in between your identities and devices and the things that they want to access. And this policy engine, which is what we refer to often as conditional access, is going to make a determination about the security of your identities and devices and grant them access to these different things according to the criteria that they meet or don't meet. So that's the concept behind zero trust, right? So you might be looking at it and thinking, well, that's, that's way too complicated. I can't possibly do uh, this in my environment. Let's, let's break it down though. So, so while zero trust does need to be thought through, there are things that you can do today that can significantly enhance the security of your environment. So if we talk about just the three things that are shown here in this, uh, in this discussion, um, we're gonna talk about implementing multi-factor authentication, checking what's called your identity secure score, and deploy Microsoft Defender for Endpoint. Three things that uh, you can uh, very quickly do that are going to significantly increase your security posture, uh, maybe just over the next six months. So let's talk first about multi-factor authentication. So when we talk about multi-factor authentication, what we're saying is that we want to prove or, or have our end users prove that they are who they claim to be every time they access data or make an attempt to access data. And we want to regularly force them to reaffirm the trustworthiness of their logon. And MFA is one way that this can be done. It protects your applications by using some second source of authentication whether that's a physical device, like a hard token, a FIDO security key, um, Windows Hello built into your laptop, or it can be a, soft, uh, a software based solution like Microsoft Authenticator or a soft token or um, a, a text message or a voice activation. Um, all of these are forms of multi-factor authentication and these can help you to ensure that the person who is asking for access to something on your network 
has a way of verifying and proving that they are who they say they are besides just a password, right? We want to move beyond the concept of passwords only for authentication because they've proven to be um, unreliable and, and easily compromised. So while you might still use passwords for certain things, um, the second factor of authentication uh, needs to be in place to prove that they are who they say they are. Now, this is kind of an interesting slide. <clears throat> so the use of MFA in the Microsoft 365 world has been an area of concern for several years now. As you can see from 2017 through 2020, we've seen a, 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 a jump in the number of multi-factor authentication um, enabled admin accounts. So it's gone from you know 0.7% to 8.9%, which is good, but that still means that 91% of admins are managing their environment without the benefit of MFA. And it becomes more urgent because we've seen that while MFA is not a magic wand, it is one of the best ways to defeat identity-based attacks. So we did see this jump, and that's good, but uh, there's still a lot of work to do. Um, actually, one of the positive things that we've seen come out of the pandemic is starting in March of last year, so just after this um, uh, January 2020 number came out, in March around the 16th, right, when uh, most of the world went on lockdown, um, we saw a jump in the number of users being enabled for MFA uh, starting in March, which is great. You know, it's a positive thing for security, but uh, we're still not at the, at the stage where we can say that most users are enabled for MFA. And this is a, a key element in securing your identities and one that's not all that hard to accomplish. Now, uh, the question becomes, where do I start? Because the, the, there's different aspects of um, securing identities, and uh, you might wonder, you know, what am I supposed to do first? And so um, we've kind of given you a list here of, of what makes the most sense. Is you know, it's good turn on MFA for your admins. Better is applying conditional access for your admins. The best is turning on MFA for everybody, using conditional access for everybody, and using what we call Azure AD privileged management for the high value um, actions that an admin needs to take. So if someone needs to perform a task that requires elevated privileges in Azure, that should be something that they can request they're given that access for two hours, let's say, and then those privileges are revoked. So no standing access to a highly privileged role within the environment. Um, now, uh, Matt, if I could uh, pick your brain a little bit more, um, I think sometimes people get intimidated by this idea of turning on MFA for uh, their users or for their admins. Um, what would you say to someone who thinks that their end users won't be able to understand how to use MFA? Yeah, it actually comes up quite a bit. And uh, as a consultant, this is where I kind of take the hard line, no sugar coating. The bottom line is this must be done. Right? Whether or not to do it is non-negotiable in my book. How to do it and how to make it you know, acceptable both to admins and, and users, there's a lot of good ways to approach it. And they're not as bad as most people think. So first and foremost, 10 years ago, this was an uphill battle. Uh, back in the RSA days, I still have a, a, a drawer full of old RSA keys uh, that actually still work. And being the security guy, none of them are labeled. So I have no idea what they're for anymore. But if you think about it from an IT department perspective, that's lost cost, lost revenue, all the tracking. I mean, remember, even to get one of those, you they were physical devices you had to go pick up, you had to sign them out, supposedly recovering them. MFA, from an administration perspective, people think is a heavy lift, and it's really not. Uh, Microsoft has made this super simple. 
uh, and secure, and that combination is very difficult, so kudos to Microsoft. But the ability to leverage, you know, existing mobile phone, uh, whether it's text or the push notification, and there's pros and cons to both. But from an admin perspective, this is straightforward. You can do it by user, by group, by privileged account. Um, the conditional access is certainly extremely powerful, um, but you can do a blanket policy across the board as well, so you can control that user experience. What What's interesting is nowadays, the admins are more scared of this than the end users. And I say that because every end user out there has got a bank account, um, potentially has a mortgage or has a, a Facebook account or whatever. And multi-factor authentication, now they may all call it something different, but that multi-factor authentication is, is required for almost all of those services now. So the right. end users are comfortable with this. Right, like, like if, you, if you've got an iPhone and you're using Face ID, Absolutely. Yeah, which I use all the time and I absolutely love it. So it's not only easy for me, the end user, but it's easy for the administration, right, to be able to set the policies and to be able to manage and track it to have all the logging you need. Um, so just a simple conversation about how this works today, what's available. And for a lot of customers, they already own the technology or the licensing, right? So it's just a little bit of education on how to do it. And then, of course, you, you know, there are some really good documentations on the end user experience, what to expect, how to bring them into the loop. But all the security being all over the news these days has brought this conversation to the to the front, which is good. End users are ready for it. They're used to it. Uh, they're kind of expecting it. And I will say it has become the minimum standard. We used to talk about deploying MFA as a way to increase security, and it absolutely does. But now we talk about MFA as the basic minimum standard for authentication and not having it put you below standards, which creates issues from an insurance perspective, cyber insurance perspective. Uh, the reality is this is being driven by a lot of customers. So we, we, we're very big in the, in the legal industry. You have law firms now that are trying to bring on a new client. The new client is saying, we need to see your security policy because you're going to have access to our data and our privileged information. You have to meet our standards if you want to do business with us. So this has become very common, which makes it easy. And I think we need to take advantage of that scenario and change that number from 8% to 80% quickly. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. Yep. All right, great. Thanks. I appreciate that. <clears throat> So, so let's move on to the second area, and that had to do with identity secure score. So now that we've discussed one of the most important ways that you can secure your organization's identity of implementing MFA, let's talk a little bit about the rest of the ways that you can secure your identity infrastructure. So within the Microsoft 365 uh, ecosystem, I guess you could say, we have an in-product collection of security recommendations for protecting against attacks and uh, generally strengthening your security posture when it comes to either user identities or devices or applications or data. And one of the components is secure score um, uh, based on identity. So what this is doing is addressing the improvements that you can make to enhance the security of your identity infrastructure. So you can measure your secure score in uh, what is effectively real time based on your configuration and use it to prioritize and plan any future improvements. So what does it look like? Well, there's two places you can actually find identity secure score. One, as you see here in the, in the picture, is in the Azure Active Directory portal. So if you go to the Security tab on your Azure Active Directory portal, you'll see under Manage a, uh, a button or you know, a, a selection here for Identity Secure Score, and it'll show you uh, where you stand on uh, security for your um, identities. 
Now, in this case, 19.61%. I'm not sure I would give them a trophy for that, but um, uh, the point that's being made here is that you can then go down here and look at the improvement actions and see what the things are that you can do to improve your security. And then if you self-identify as a particular industry, um, it'll show you how you compare against other uh, people who have identified themselves as being in the same industry, or if you wanna look at, um, uh, see how you compare against uh, a company of a similar size, regardless of industry, you can look at that. And then over here, which I'll show you when I do the demo real quick, um, you can see how your score has trended over the last, uh, you know, whatever period of time you want to look at. <clears throat> so this is what Identity Secure Score looks like in Azure. Uh, there's a, another similar interface within the M365 Admin Center, and that's the one that I'll be doing my demo out of. So Matt, before I get into the demo, um, why do you think, or, or why would you suggest to your customers that uh, using Identity Secure Score is a reasonable starting point for organizations to use in, in uh, strengthening or shoring up their security? Yeah, so for me, it's all about the KISS theory, right? Keep, keeping it simple. Security is, unless you have a dedicated team, that literally is staying current day by day for trends and risks and, and you know different attack uh, vectors and that sort of stuff. It's almost impossible for any group or IT department to stay current and be aware of everything that's out there. The other thing is uh, Microsoft you know, is rolling out tons of additional features on a regular basis. And with those new features being 100% um, knowledge on all of it is difficult. So what Microsoft has done is said, start here with Secure Score, right? And we will continually evaluate your environment. We will show you where your risks are, where your best bang for the buck is, right? You can spend 10 minutes and do this one thing and close some notable gaps. Uh, that's huge, right? It just makes it simple. It's visual. It gives you a focus area from an IT perspective. It gives you a list you can go back to management with and say, here's a roadmap and a budget. Internally, I've got several IT departments I work with that almost use this as a competition, right? They're always, you know, kind of seeing who's got the better score and then who can who can raise their score faster. Because the, the funny thing is, don't ever get frustrated with this. If you go in there on a Monday and your score is at, you know, 280, and then you go in there on Wednesday and, and it's 190, you're like, oh man, what happened? Well, there were some additional um, up things that popped into the environment that you need to do or should do to get that score back up. So to me, that's the biggest advantage. Security is a verb. It's something you do and redo and continue to do. And this allows you to go to one place and quickly assess what needs to be done at the moment. And then you take care of it, your score's up, you're good, you check it again in a week and you up or a month or whatever your cycle is. And it is it helps you continue to keep security top of mind. It keeps security um, as an action, something you're continually doing. It gives you support from an IT perspective, going to your administration. Uh, it also gives you visibility into new features and functions you may not be aware of, which to me, that's one of the biggest ones. Yeah, I agree. Um, so let's take a quick look at it. Let's uh, pop out of here. And I'll show you. This is Secure Score. <clears throat> so, this is in the M365 admin portal, as I mentioned. And we're looking here at the Microsoft Secure Score. So, this is the uh, combination of your identity secure score, your device secure score, your application secure score. And if we were managing any data, um, that would be listed here too. <clears throat> but uh, what this is showing is your secure score. Um, in, in this case, it's a little bit better, 45%. And then here are the tasks that we can do, that we can perform that will improve security. Now notice that the uh, tasks are uh, categorized. In other words, 
from an identity standpoint, this is the uh, one that shows up as, as being the uh, current one that we need to address. But we can um, uh, go into one of these, for example, and it will show me what needs to be done, what the impact is to my users if I, uh, for example, MFA is what, what's being discussed here. So when you register and challenge your users for MFA, they'll be prompted to authenticate with a second factor. And who are the people that uh, would be impacted by performing this task? Everybody. What are the steps that I need to perform? Um, it, it tells me what the licensing is that I need, uh, depending on which features I'm interested in and how far along we are in the implementation. So 15 out of 278 users are registered and protected. And then I can get more information about MFA if I want to. Um, in this case, I don't have right access to this environment, but um, I would have the ability to uh, change these as, um, uh, as, as the, the plans have been implemented. And when that's been implemented, my points achieved here would go from 0.48 to 9, and that would improve my security score for identity uh, by a significant amount. So I can go in here and filter according to identity, and this shows me all the identity-related tasks that are recommended uh, for my environment. I can track the secure score over time. Um, as, uh, as Matt had pointed out, you might go from, um, you know, uh, at 100% uh, my secure score went down to 0%. Um, probably somebody turned something off in, in uh, the environment uh, so that you could see the improvements being uh, made. But um, these, these drops that you see here are not necessarily, um, that maybe a new product has been introduced, but there are some things that you need to do on a daily basis. For example, looking at audit logs, things like that. You can't just do that once. As Matt pointed out, security is a verb. So if you don't do that for a period of time, your score is going to slowly deteriorate, right? And then here's your metrics and trends. Um, so here's the comparison against organizations like yours, uh, and things like that, you know, how, how have we regressed in the score? So it's a good way to uh, kind of evaluate where you are in terms of security and have a plan for um, addressing the most significant elements of uh, the, the things that impact your security. So let's pop back in. Oh, go ahead, please. Yeah, Dave, was, one thing I was going to mention was, and this is something that we use on a regular basis, if we, you know, a second ago you, you went in and showed like the MFA uh, and it gives you the different, the section where it shows you your different licensing requirements and who all would be impacted. One of the things there is that you actually have a link that you can click. It will take you directly to the Azure Active Directory uh, conditional access page or blade. That's right. huge as as the, the the service is evolving, knowing where to do everything becomes a little bit difficult. And if you look at some of the documentation, it says, well, just go into conditional access and enable this. Well, great, how do I get there, right? So from here, it's point, click, and you're there. It makes it so much easier. Uh, the last thing I wanted to mention on the secure score, is, so we have a, a managed security offering uh, here at New Era. One of the things we've been discussing, this isn't live yet, so this is all between us, but one of the things we're discussing is actually assessing these for a customer at the beginning of an engagement. And if they are at a particular uh, security score or higher and can maintain it, there's a potential the, the service will be cheaper or waive a setup fee or something along that line because one, we want to incent people to do the right thing, uh, which is huge. Uh, and also because it means that the company is invested in security and it is a partnership between our SOC service, our security offering, the customer and Microsoft. Security through all of this is a partnership and everybody has a responsibility. So we're incenting that and the higher their score, potentially their low, the lower their cost. Interesting. I, I didn't know that you guys were doing that. That's cool. And guys, I'll add to that. Sorry, Dave. I'll add at the end of the event, we always have our uh, questions after the event's done. 
obtaining your secure score is part of that. So if you folks would like some assistance, you just have to say yes, and uh, our team will follow up. Very cool. Thanks, Joe. So the third point that we were going to discuss is Microsoft Defender for Endpoint. <clears throat> now, this is kind of an interesting slide um, because what, what it's illustrating here is, is a, a fact that we've known for a long time, and that is that um, the bad guys follow the crisis. So whenever there is, let's say, a hurricane that devastates a city in the United States or there's a bombing somewhere in the world, um, immediately thereafter what you'll see is criminal groups um, attempting to capitalize off that event in order to compromise environments so they might start sending out emails that say you know help the victims of hurricane whatever or help the victims of the bombing in wherever and uh, they'll they'll get people to click on links provide information and they'll compromise um, either environments or individual users. And so the same was true, as you might expect, uh, with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Once uh, we, we uh, saw the uh, World Health Organization declared a global health emergency and uh, it's named COVID-19, once the first confirmed death took place in, in February 29, um, we, we were already seeing this ramping up of encounters with COVID-19 themed attacks. Um, it started uh, to increase again as the U.S. announced their travel ban to Europe. Um, it did drop off after a little bit, um, but then we started seeing it bump up again in June. So who knows what, what the next crisis will be. Uh, let's hope we get a little bit of a break in between, but uh, recognize that, that, that criminal groups are, are using this methodology to get malware distributed to organizations. They will always follow the crisis. So whenever you see something in the news, the chances are good that an attacker is developing malware and trying to get it to you based on that news. Now, Microsoft Defender for Endpoint is built into Windows 10 version 1703 and higher, as well as on Windows Server 2019. So you don't have to deploy any agents if you're using those versions of Windows, which is nice, it's already built in. Um, now, Matt, I think many organizations will kind of chuckle when you mention Microsoft Defender as any sort of endpoint solution, because quite honestly, it had a terrible reputation several years ago. Um, is that perception accurate today in your opinion, or, or why should people even bother looking at Defender? Yeah, that perception is definitely not accurate. Uh, and I've been doing this, you know, like I said, 25 plus years in the Microsoft space. And I never thought I would say Microsoft and security in the same sentence without a punchline. Uh, and that's the reality, right? And I say that somewhat tongue in cheek, but it's true. Microsoft had never been known for security services, security offerings, or being a secure product. Now, part of that, and this is kind of the best and worst of what we're talking about here, one of the reasons Microsoft was always such a big target is because they've also got the biggest deployment. If you look at you know technology in general in you know the worldwide, you know, the majority or the largest uh, deployment is a Windows-based device. So they've got the biggest target. Well, Microsoft has turned that around. Better code, uh, faster services, everything. That, I mean, they've invested billions every year in security, but they've also leveraged that deployment, that, that wide deployment across the world to create a system that has more signals than any provider, period. You take your top AV products, whether it's Symantec or McAfee's or Sophos, Carbon Black, Silence. Those are fantastic products, by the way, Carbon Black and Silence. We've used those at a lot of customers. I love the product. They are extremely intrusive and that where they, they're somewhat difficult to use because they're not built into the code. Everything they do, they're having to uh, kind of manipulate the device instead of working with the device. So Defender being built in, or endpoint protection being built into the code makes it substantially more effective. Uh, it, has, it takes less code to have a bigger impact. Uh, the other thing that is unique to the Microsoft offering, and, and this 
cannot be understated. This is huge, right? So if a, if a virus hits a device or malware hits a device, one of your other products out there can notify. You may even be able to isolate it or shut it down, and we'll, we'll see some of this. But what Microsoft can offer is that trail to see how the device or how that malware got in. Because Microsoft is involved in the email side, the, the remote access side, the data center side, the device side, the mobile side, instead of being told, hey, you had a problem on a PC, Microsoft will tell you, hey, you had a problem on a PC, and by the way, they attempted it on these other 10. Let's go look at those as well. Two of those, you know, the person, the people opened that email, uh, and of those two, one of them actually executed it. So to be able to take that level of information is critical to a security response. And I haven't seen a product out there that has the visibility into an environment that Microsoft does. Yeah, great, thank you, appreciate that. <clears throat> so we, we've been talking about this uh, concept of zero trust and, and uh, how Defender plays into that story is that uh, Defender allows you to control the device state and the health of the device. So um, as you start implementing zero trust and you're able to get visibility into whether the device is secure, whether there are any malicious apps on it, whether um, it's been encrypted, uh, some of these are things that uh, Defender uh, performs natively. Some of them are OS type of uh, configurations, but the point is uh, Defender natively provides much of this information to conditional access and can help um, uh, enhance the uh, signal that is given to conditional access as it runs through that policy engine and allows you to um, effectively gauge the health of the devices. <clears throat> and that's what's being described here is that um, endpoint manager or Intune or SCCM, whatever it is that you're using uh, to manage your devices, uh, the devices are going to report their compliance status. Um, you can implement conditional access based on that compliance status. And if the device is not compliant, then maybe you automatically block the device. You might wipe the device. You can automatically remediate the device. Or if they are compliant, then uh, maybe you allow them directly to the uh, uh, the service that they're requesting. Maybe you uh, require the user to also perform MFA. Maybe you require the end user to enroll the device, right? So um, it's not just the health of the device that we're looking at, but also what is their status as far as the organization is concerned? That's what we mean by enrolling the device. <clears throat> so let's take a quick look at Defender, uh, at least the interface for it. <clears throat> And uh, if we go back here to incidents, so again, I'm still in the M365 uh, security uh, homepage. And what you'll notice here, uh, just kind of as a side point, is that we're starting to pull all the security related things into this one portal. So uh, we've got the information about the endpoints, but we're also getting information about email and collaboration. Uh, different uh, threats that are being uh, uh, observed that are coming through email. So pretty soon you won't have to have um, uh, work being done in the Exchange Online uh, security area, but it can all be done in here. Now, if we look at uh, the uh, incidents that are taking place in the environment, we've got uh, an example that shows here, a malicious file was detected based on indication provided by Office 365 on a single endpoint. As I expand this, it shows me uh, the different instances of that alert. <clears throat> and as we start to uh, scroll down and see how the uh, alert was initially generated, we have a timeline on the side here that shows how things progressed what um, executables or processes were involved in the attack. We see here the malicious file that was identified. We see uh, the, you know, for example, Word was uh, involved in this attack. And as we, we kind of uh, uh, dig into these things, you get things like file hashes and 
um, process IDs and all the different things that you need to start investigating the attack. You get recommended actions on this side for how to investigate it. You can determine or, or make the um, uh, determination whether it was a true alert, a false alert. And um, if you go over here, you can actually do hunting based on some of the information that you may have uh, derived from that initial investigation. So using Custo query language, you can go in here and say, for example, um, there's some shared queries here. You can say, um, I'm going to look for campaigns related to um, APT29. So that's a, uh, a well-known uh, moniker for one of the Russian threat groups. So you can look for device process events within the last uh, seven days, for example. You run the query, and uh, there's nothing found in that case, but that's fine. It's just uh, I was just taking a shot to see if that was one that showed up. Uh, you can spend hours demonstrating what's going on here with um, uh, Defender, but uh, as Matt was saying, uh, it's progressed a long way from the days of, uh, for example, Microsoft Security Essentials and, and those uh, kind of joke antivirus products. Uh, it's a very well-respected uh, within the community type of uh, product, and uh, we hope you'll uh, take a look at it and see, see if it fits within your organization's needs. So let's uh, move on from here. We're kind of getting close on time. Uh, what I'm going to show you here and, and what will be available to you as a, as, as a, uh, a resource after the fact are uh, three slides here. So the first one is if you're an Office 365 only customer, so all you've got is Office 365, not the full M365 suite, what can you do today? What can you do next week? What can you do next month to improve your security? Right? We've already talked about identifying or identity secure score, enabling MFA, but there's some other things that you can do as well and that you can make a plan for implementing over the next uh, couple months. If you've got Azure AD Premium P1, uh, there's a, a, a larger uh, set of, of controls that you can implement. Uh, take a look at these and see if these can be on your security planning uh, motions. And then if you have Active Directory Plan 2, so maybe you're on M365 E5 as an example, uh, there's a, an even further uh, list of, of products and uh, tools that you can implement to secure your environment. So I'm sorry I had to go through that fairly quickly, but uh, Joe, you want to take over from here and talk about areas where New Era can help? Yeah, for sure, Dave and, and Matt. Thank you. That was that was great. A lot of a lot of content there, folks. These are all on the uh, post webinar uh, questions that I mentioned before. But quickly, uh, a few ways. So this one hour discovery session, um, no cost way to talk to our team talk about some of the bigger issues that were raised today. We'll come up and understand what the current challenges are and see how we can help you provide some sort of a plan, a roadmap, as Dave just sort of showed there. Um, second one, Dave, if you don't mind, some fairly specific offerings. Here's an identity and access management working session. You can see the, the four or five items there that we will we'll go through. So typically, I think this is maybe a 12 to 16 hour engagement, if I recall, nothing too large, just to get this um, this solution going. Next one, Dave, is uh, MFA. We talked a lot about that today. So if we want to um, get that going in your environment, see what it looks like, see how it can help you guys. And then lastly, um, the Azure single sign-on. As I mentioned, all of those things will be on the post-webinar survey so go ahead and select those if you want to take advantage of any of those i didn't see any questions at this moment but if you do have some folks you can reach out to your new era rep you can reach out to myself or anyone here on the panel and i will say i, I don't think we have the date here but look soon for part two of this three-part series and again if you have any comments and topics that you'd like to see covered please put those in the um in the survey that's coming with that dave and matt i i can't thank you enough i think there was a 
a lot of great content and uh, it was really great to hear you guys talk about how it's applicable in the real world. Anything you guys want to add before we close? I'm good. Awesome. Well, everyone, thank you again and, and have a great day. Thanks, everybody.